From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, the future of the social security system. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. Back in the depression year of 1935, Congress set up a system called Social Security, designed to support people in retirement, plus the widowed, the orphaned, and later on the disabled. Social Security is paid for by payroll taxes on workers, employers, and the self-employed. For many years, those taxes more than covered benefit payments. But several things have happened that have increased the burden on the system. People are retiring earlier, living longer, and enjoying higher levels of benefits. All this makes it more expensive to support the retired population. And because of the dramatic decline in the birth rate, the growth in the working population will slow down, meaning that the burden of support on each worker will grow. In 1977, American workers and employers paid in about $82 billion in payroll taxes. Uncle Sam paid out $88 billion in benefits. Deficits such as this, nearly $6 billion, cannot continue for long. How should this imbalance be corrected? Should future Social Security benefits rise with living standards? What relationship is there, or should there be, between Social Security and private pensions? Welcome to another Public Policy Forum, presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute a non-profit, non-partisan research and education organization. Today's roundtable topic concerns the future of the Social Security system. Appearing on our panel are James Cardwell, Commissioner of the Social Security Administration since 1973. Commissioner Cardwell has been a government executive involved in people-oriented areas of the Health, Education, and Welfare Department and the Food and Drug Administration for nearly 25 years. Al Ullman, is chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. An Oregon Democrat, Chairman Ullman is currently serving his 10th term in Congress. He is alternate chairman of the Joint Senate House Committee on Internal Revenue Taxation and is former chairman of the House Budget Committee. Barbara Conable, Jr. is serving his seventh term in Congress from Western New York State. Congressman Conable is the ranking Republican on the House Ways and Means Committee. He is considered an expert on taxation, Social Security, Welfare, and International Trade. W. Allen Wallace is Chancellor of the University of Rochester. Chancellor Wallace was Chairman of the Advisory Council on Social Security in 1974 and 75. He has taught economics at Yale, Stanford, Rochester, and the University of Chicago, where he was Dean of the Graduate School of Business from 1956 to 1962. Mr. Wallace once served as special assistant to President Eisenhower. He is currently an adjunct scholar of the American Enterprise Institute. John Charles Daly will moderate the discussion. Mr. Daly is a former news correspondent and commentator for CBS News and a former ABC News executive. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This uh, public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is concerned with the future of the Social Security system. For some time now, the Social Security system has shared an unhappy estate with the weather. Everybody was talking about it, but nobody was doing much about it. The basic problem is financial, and it's very familiar to all of us. It's called an excess of outgo over income. Now, one can read in the press that with no change in the present law, the Disability Trust Fund will be broke, depleted is the uh, polite word, by 1978 or 1979, and that the old age trust fund will be depleted early in the 1980s. Sharply increased Social Security taxes and maximum taxable wages, scheduled perhaps over the next 20 years, are one obvious proposal. Others propose mandatory coverage of federal, state, and local government uh, workers, a universal coverage concept, phasing out the now separate pension systems in these areas. Still others concern that in the end, general treasury revenues will be used to bail out 
or rather fund the Social Security system, proposed termination of authority for the Social Security funds to borrow money from the Treasury income tax revenues. They seem to worry about the foot in the door that could lead to, quote, a great Treasury raid. Well, argument swirls around indexing, double dipping, unequal status for women, regressive taxation, et cetera, et cetera. It is clear that something has to be done. The question is, what? Well, to establish a broad base for the dialogue, gentlemen, will you, in turn, briefly address that question, what is to be done? First, Mr. Congressman. Well, Mr. Moderator, the uh, Social Security system is uh, an American institution uh, that uh, it is so important in our system of things that there is no way that the, the Congress is going to allow it to get into uh, a defunct status where it will not pay benefits. Now, it is not easy to manage a fund of that size and to raise taxes, but uh, and, and there are many ways that that problem can be approached, and we in the Congress uh, are in the throes of, of doing that. Uh, but uh, I think there's one thing you can be sure, we will keep it solvent and the benefits will be there. Now, I'm opposed to general revenues, and I think the Congress is opposed to the use of general revenues. Uh, I think we must maintain the integrity of the trust fund concept, where you increase benefits, you also increase taxes. Representative Conable. Uh, John, I think uh, I would agree with the chairman that the Social Security system is a very central, uh, important, and visible part of our, our uh, security in this country, a very important part of the government, a growing part of the government. And uh, it shares uh, in common with the rest of the government the problem uh, that it's difficult for politicians to restrain their enthusiasm for making it all things to all people. Uh, we, we have to restrain our, that enthusiasm. Uh, it's uh, started encroaching, for instance, on the private pension system to a very substantial degree. The private pension system is an important source of capital formation in this country, uh, adds to the flexibility of our retirement plans, and Social Security, if we let it get out of control, can easily destroy that. We have to keep it uh, sound financially, as the chairman says. Um, uh, one of the most destructive things that can happen is to have the kind of publicity it's had lately where people have lost confidence in the future of the system. Uh, since it is a mandatory system that, uh, that uh, part is particularly irksome to Americans who have to participate in it. Um, in that connection, I think we must move toward universal coverage for political reasons, if not for economic reasons. The members of Congress themselves must participate in the Social Security system or uh, I'm afraid uh, we're going to find the public increasingly cynical about our non-participation and our manipulation of it for political reasons. <laughs> we have to stay away from the welfare relationship. Uh, because there are poor people on Social Security, there's a tendency to, to, to want to make it into a welfare system. But we have a good welfare system, uh, particularly the SSI uh, for the elderly people, that's paid for by all the taxpayers and not just by those on uh, on, uh, that pay through payroll taxes. And that's the last thing I think we must do. We must always keep in mind the, the means of financing of Social Security, namely the payroll tax, can become very destructive since it's a tax on labor in economic terms if we let it get out of control. Chancellor Wallace, will you address that question, what is to be done? One very important step um, would be to correct a technical error that was made five years ago when they put in the automatic cost of living adjustment. They uh, made a mistake and uh, as a result that's out of control. That is the, the benefits now are uh, blown around in the wind of a variety of forces, demographic, uh, changes in the price levels, changes in productivity and are not controlled by Congress anymore. That would be fairly simple to correct and uh, Congress is seriously doing it right now. That would eat up about half of the, over half of the long run deficit that's now anticipated. So it's not at all inconsequential. 
Then there are a lot of uh, comparatively smaller things that, that need to be done, none of which is really small, such as the universal coverage. Uh, got down to things like uh, the retirement test, the situation by which uh, a person past 65 uh, can earn a little bit and keep it, but if he earns beyond a certain amount, uh, he loses more and more of his Social Security. And while there are good reasons for that, it's impossible to sell that uh, to the public. That is, they see that a person who is getting a million dollars a year clipping coupons off of bonds gets his full Social Security. But if they work and earn $5,000 a year, they lose their Social Security, and no amount of rationalization seems to convince them that that's equitable or me either, for that matter. <laughs> and, and then um, there is an enormous amount of complexity in the system. So I, and I think it's important to try to get that simplified so that the public will have some understanding. This absolutely undermines their confidence in it. They can't go around to a Social Security office and get an answer to anything, or they can go around twice and get two answers in different offices. And that's unavoidable with the system. Finally, I think it's important to make some really basic studies. The system has never really been studied thoroughly, and it's only in the last three or four years that any economists have taken it seriously. It's been essentially labor economists and uh, welfare economists that have studied it as a kind of ad, as if it were part of social service, and nobody has really seriously tried to study the effects of it. And there are a lot of studies going on now, mostly under the, many of them under the sponsorship of the American Enterprise Institute which I think will lay the groundwork for a much more careful study of the, some of the kinds of issues that Barbara Conable brought up, for example. What is the effect on investment and what will be the long-run effect on the income of the country? All right, Commissioner Cardwell? I think I would have to agree with um, those who have gone before me who have said that we need to improve uh, public confidence in the system. To do that, I think we need to improve public understanding. Uh, but before we can do that, we need to better understand ourselves, what the problems now facing the system are, their dimensions, and we need to put before ourselves some choices. I don't think it's any longer possible to look out into the future and ask the question about the future of Social Security without looking at a great many other things, things that are interrelated. If it is true, as I believe it certainly uh, will be true, that we will have fewer workers, more older people drawing retirement benefits in the years ahead. Then I suspect it's also true that we'll have fewer children and young people uh, as a burden to that uh, aspect of our society and our economy. We need to better understand how these things might interrelate. We certainly need to examine the interrelationship between so-called welfare and social services and social security. In short, we need to stop and realize that we have here a very uh, important uh, institution in the American way of life. But like all important institutions, we can not take it for granted. And there comes a time when we should stop and reassess it, ask ourselves some basic questions about it and perhaps make some new and perhaps even different choices about what we want it to be. All right, well, let's go back to the beginning. As I remember it, back in the 30s, Social Security at birth, at least my layman's understanding of it was, that it was conceived as an actuarially sound retirement insurance program. Now, uh, Chairman Allman, I would like to ask you, has its basic character changed uh, to, for instance, a guaranteed annuity? Uh, perhaps with no sound actuarial funding basis. Well, it has changed uh, significantly over the years. It, it's more than a retirement program. It's a disability program now. It's a survivor's program. It's a health uh, Medicare program. All of these now are in, in Social Security. So when somebody talks about investing some money and, and uh, watching it grow and being able to do as well as Social Security, they generally forget about disability, survivors, and the other benefits that we have. Uh, it, it has changed, obviously, in other ways. It, it, it was never intended as a full retirement program. It was intended as a base layer of retirement, and, uh, and therefore we, we don't tax investment-type incomes. Everyone is supposed to, uh, to do everything they can within our system to develop other 
kinds of uh, benefits in their old age from, uh, from uh, rentals or stocks or from other private pension programs. Uh, and that's one of our problems uh, now in trying to include federal workers. And I think ultimately we're going to have to have universal coverage. But the problem is uh, how you integrate the two systems so that you don't uh, render a real hardship on, on those involved. It can be done. I think that you can, take, you can de de develop uh, an integrated system where, uh, where Social Security is interwoven with retirement uh, and uh, you get uh, approximately the same amount of benefits, but you have people contributing to the Social Security system. I think it's intended that every American should participate. And over the years, we've added the farmers and the small business people and, and the doctors and lawyers and, and so on. And they're, uh, they're now all included pretty much except uh, the federal workers. We've included now uh, about 75% of the state and local employees are covered. So it's been a changing system. And, uh, uh, and, and in the process of uh, making those changes, uh, we have to look at, uh, at the actuarial basis and, and the funding. Another significant change is that uh, the amount of outside earnings that you, can, uh, that you can make and still draw Social Security. If uh, we indeed eliminate uh, any restriction on outside earnings, then it becomes an annuity program and you can continue on your job uh, and still draw Social Security. Now there's some likelihood, there's a lot of uh, uh, people want to do that but it changes the, the nature of the program. So it's an evolving system, but it's still basically sound, and it's the basic layer of retirement income, disability, uh, survivor's uh, insurance uh, for all Americans, and that's what it should be. Congressman John, Conable. Uh, Al has described a number of changes within the program, and it's clear, it clearly is an evolving program. It, in some ways, it's evolved too much. but. It's interesting also to note that the society in which this, uh, this is a central institution has also changed dramatically. For instance, uh, in 1935, when the, when the law was passed, uh, there were virtually no women in the workforce. Uh, there weren't many men either, as a matter of fact, at that time. But, uh, <laughs> Happy memory. Uh, but certainly there were no, uh, no women. And so the great concern was... Uh, that you, you wanted to take care of, uh, of housewives who were not related to the workforce through their husbands. And nowadays, you've got uh, a dramatically changed situation. The, the wor workforce is approaching 50% women. And working women are not really taken care of in any adequate way by this institution because it wasn't designed to do that. And, but fortunately, these demographic changes and changes in the workforce and so forth are, are determinable. And, and you can look ahead, for instance, and see what the demograph demographic forces are going to be bearing on this program through the next 20 or 30 years because of the birth rate and for other reasons. And, um, and even though government does such things badly, this is one institution then with which we can plan knowing what the facts are going to be. And, and so we really ought to consider issues like how we take care of, uh, of a third of our population in the year 2010 uh, with only two-thirds of the population working. Barbara, it seems to me the most depressing thing about the whole system is taking the long-run view. Uh, I'm not terribly upset about the short-run view. Uh, when that gets acute enough, uh, Congress will act just in the nick of time. I don't think Congress has the capacity to plan ahead, nor the government in general. And uh, the, some, of the, some members know what's going to happen, and some committees know. You have committees that see that you should have universal coverage, but the whole Congress doesn't see that. Uh, and on the if contrary... If you're depressed about that, Alan, you ought to be in Congress. So. And on the contrary... <laughs> On the contrary, they see the political pressures that prevent that. Now, if you take the long-run view, it's clear that the, um, that the people born in the baby boom from 1945 to the late 60s will begin to retire about 2010 and keep retiring uh, 20, 30 years after that, and they, will, they won't disappear the year after they enter it either. The longevity is increasing. And they, at, they will be supported by the people uh, that weren't born, so to speak, in the, in the birth dearth of recent years, that is, the 
whereas it's estimated now that for every person being supported on Social Security, there are three workers sharing the burden. It's estimated that by that time there'll only be two. Now, if you try to think what the consequences of that will be, they'll, you know, if they maintain the benefits, they will have to raise the amount of taxes they take. And as they raise the amount of taxes, that is going to have a very substantial disincentive effect, which will show up in a variety of ways. One will be that people will not be as willing to move to jobs where they're more productive. They will be more willing to move, say, to the southwest or the Sun Belt and away from the northeast to areas where they can get income in kind, uh, lie around in the sun or go fishing, and the government can't lay its hands on that income. So there will be a tendency to avoid money income, and that will make it necessary to raise the tax even higher than it would have been. It'll be an accumulative effect. Well, now you may say that maybe they'll control the benefits, but look at the politics of that. The same, just as politicians now turn handsprings and do cartwheels and get their faces lifted and their hair dyed to appeal to the young, in, in, those, <laughs> in, in those days, they're going to be having wrinkles, impla wrinkles implanted and their hair bleached white and uh, affecting canes and crutches and so on because that'll be the dominant view. So they're not going to, they're not going to cut the benefits. They're going to raise them. Now, well, that's going to force face them with two situations. One, they, they've got to raise the benefits and they can't raise the taxes, so what will they do? They'll print the money. And, uh, you can, and now the effects of that, you can see that in a great many other countries. That's been the history of this type of system, social security systems almost everywhere. It takes 60 to 100 years for it really to culminate. That ha tears the social fabric asunder in all kinds of ways, wipes out the middle class, gives everybody the idea that uh, they'll, the way to look after yourself is to get control of the government, puts everybody at each other's throats. Now, I think there are some offsetting factors. Uh, Bruce referred to the fact that uh, with no children, we don't have to put so much resources into education. I'd worry about the political angles there. The education lobby is the biggest, the most effective lobby in the country. That's true. Uh, they want to spend more on education. They already do. As the enrollment goes down, they want, they want, they want to. Um, there, but I think the, the most optimistic thing is that, to my knowledge, all social forecasts of the sort I just made have proved worthless. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Well, Commissioner, would you give us a, a view of the social forecast as you just heard it? With well, I think Alan has, uh, has generally laid out some of the vital statistics. It is true that the uh, ratio of workers paying into the system uh, compared to retirees drawing out of the system will change as we go into the future. The statistics of 3 to 1 and 2 to 1 uh, are correct. It's also, I think, a sad fact of life and one that we just have to face up to, and that is the realization that the present system, the present benefit formula, which fails to provide uh, adequate benefits for a great many people who depend on the system, particularly those living in large urban areas who have no other means of support post-retirement, that that system is for the long term. When, when you look at uh, the demographics as we best understand them. And if you look at a fairly um, moderate view of a long-term uh, American economy, the system is seriously underfinanced. And we really have to uh, recognize and uh, make some choices about our willingness to pay more, or we might have to make some choices about the kinds of classes of benefits that we offer. Now, I, for one, believe that the time has come it may it probably is overdue. But the disability portion of the program is clearly costing more than uh, the, uh, its originators anticipated. And my guess is if the facts were laid out to the American public, it's costing more than they're probably willing to pay. So I think we've got to look at that particular side of the benefit structure and probably look at it uh, with a deliberate view to reduce the benefit costs. But competing with that, uh, it seems to me, are some drives, some uh, public concerns uh, to increase benefit costs. I mentioned one, the fact that it can be easily demonstrated that many people now served by, by the program uh, do not have adequate uh, income as a result of the program once they reach old age. Another uh, competing force 
that would drive, tend to drive benefits up, it seems to me, is the interest uh, that the women's movement has in equal treatment for women. I somehow think that that will have a plus price tag once we rationalize it. That's not to say that it isn't justified, but it does represent a, the kind of trade-off that we're going to have to face. Well, Mr. Congressman. the government is a business of making choices. Correct. And I, I, uh, I can't accept Alan's pessimism when we know what choices we have to make. Uh, I acknowledge that, that uh, Congress and the government in general have not been good at planning ahead, but frequently they have to deal with, uh, with options that occur in a much shorter time frame than the options we're talking about here. And I see no reason why we can't plan ahead. We know what the facts are going to be. I would like to suggest that one thing that may very well happen to the Social Security system is that we may separate those elements out of the system out that are not actuarially based. For instance, um, Medicare uh, total coverage uh, is available to anybody who has basic uh, uh, Social Security coverage. And uh, you don't take out in relation as you pay in. Uh, with Medicare. Disability is another similar situation. And uh, these may very well be, be eventually hived off to, to all the taxpayers and not just the payroll taxpayers. I would hate to see us do that with the actuarially based part of the system, the insurance part, the, the part that uh, deals with old age uh, 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 and survivorship. The council did recommend that uh, Medicare be taken off the payroll tax since the benefits have no relation to average earnings. Well, well we can't load the system up with a whole lot of things that are un, uh, not related actuarially. Uh, or if we do, it's pretty clear the whole thing will founder. I think there's been too much pessimism about where the Social Security Fund is now, long range and short run. We have had this this drawdown in recent years due in the last three years particularly due in part to the recession, partly to inflation, partly to the buildup in disability for, for uh, reasons we don't fully comprehend. But it is not a difficult uh, task to set that short-term uh, uh, system right. Uh, and, and in fact, when you look at the long-range problems, about 60% of your long-range problems can be taken care of by making the proper adjustments in the cost of living allowances. And, and I think Congress is ready to do that. I think that, that it's not fair to characterize Congress as being irresponsible. Congress, uh, certainly, we have a propensity to vote the easy things uh, and, uh, and avoid the hard things. That's, that's human nature. That's not Congress. But, <laughs> When it comes to, to keeping this Social Security system solvent, short range and long range, the Congress will do it. And as Barbara says, uh, our business is, is looking at alternatives and making decisions. And uh, I, I have great confidence that the Congress, this Congress will face up to, uh, to not just the short range problem. We can very, we very easily can take care uh, of, of uh, I think, 85% of the long-range problem, uh, and, and it doesn't take a lot of adjustments, and I, I think we can fully take care uh, of the short-range problem and will. I just say when I <coughs> said I don't think Congress has the capacity to plan ahead, I, did not, I do not attribute that to the irresponsibility of Congress or congressmen. I attribute that to the influence of pressure groups in the electoral process. Let me, before we, we get away from it altogether, we have been flitting around a subject which is, as a layman, I think uh, perhaps needs uh, first identification specifically as the problem of indexing, which you, you can read about in the newspapers. And I'm very impressed with the conviction you all have that uh, the indexing problem can be straightened out in the near term and that its impact on the deficit will be, be quite remarkable. Over half of the deficit can disappear o overnight. So which one of you has the courage to define indexing? <laughs> Tell what we have been doing and actually what the change will be made. Well, of course, Alan, you well, once... of course <laughs> indexing simply means adjusting something uh, according to an index number. As in the case of the benefits, when they're said to be indexed, that simply means they go up according to the cost of living index. 
the proposal for, cor for correcting the error amounts to indexing your recorded wages. Instead of ca carrying on their books what you actually earned uh, 20 years ago, they'll adjust that for the change that's occurred in average earnings between 20 years ago and now. So the number they carry on their books will be an indexed wage for you reflecting the changes in wage levels that have occurred since, since you actually earned the wages. And the difficulty with the present system is that when the, the error they made was that when they put in the cost of living adjustment, it was, it was just right for somebody who had just retired or was already retired. It would raise his benefits as the cost of living rose. They forgot that somebody who hadn't yet retired would find his benefits going up anyway because his wages would be inflated along with the price level. And to that extent, if he were going to work his whole career under the new level, he wouldn't need any raise in the benefit schedule because his higher wages would have brought him into, the, into a higher benefit anyway. They overlooked that, and so in effect he gets a double, they use the phrase like double dipping and so on, double indexing. I heard the, the, the phrase double dipping, uh, which has to do with the universal concept, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that universal concept has support and it does not have support. It is not uh, evidently at this moment in time acceptable to a majority of the Congress and is a, a, a request for further study on the matter. But is the double dipping issue still a lively one in the terms of its uh, originally surfacing? Let, let me explain very briefly what the double dipping is. Uh, the ordinary person uh, who works in, in uh, the workforce and pays Social Security pays it on the first dollar he makes all the way through to the, uh, up to the wage base limit all the way through to the time he retires. But, but, uh, and so those people who aren't under the system like federal employees uh, can go through most of their uh, work life without paying anything into the system, but then they can move in moonlighting or, or subsequent to retirement or some other way, and, and about half of them do, or more than half, uh, and, um, and therefore they can pick up Social Security benefits the cheap and easy way uh, by, uh, by paying only a short period of time during their work life, whereas the normal citizen pays during all of his work life. And that's what, that's what we call a double dipping, but it is a problem and a very serious one, and, and one of the reasons that universal coverage has to come about eventually. Uh, on, uh, but we can't do it, obviously, until we do get an integrated program that, that people can understand so that federal employees can understand that they can do it without being, uh, with, uh, without being uh, hurt, uh, uh, both either from, from the point of view of the deductions or the po uh, point of view of the benefits. Double dipping wouldn't be a serious problem if it weren't for the fact that we have weighted the benefits at the low end of the scale on the theory that those who have borne scant relation to the workforce uh, are in fact poor people. In fact, many of them are not poor but have been working under a, a different system, one that is not covered by Social Security. And so they get uh, a degree of windfall as a result of of just getting the minimum coverage of Social Security uh, and then being paid on the assumption that they're poor because they have only minimum coverage. Bruce, wasn't it estimated that of the ballooning at the bottom of the scale to take care of the very poor, that at least a third of that goes to those who are very well off? Easily a third, I would say. And Probably it's because more. Of, and they, they look poor because as Congressman Ullman indicated they worked only a short time under Social Security, so the numbers Social Security has on its books and averages up look as if they didn't make much during their careers. Yeah, the system, uh, put it another way, uh, it will look at the record uh, of, say, 10 years worth of post-retirement work by a federal re uh, employee who has a very generous retirement to begin with. He would read his record as if he were a poor person and will give him a, a, an extra benefit assuming that he is indeed poor, when as a matter of fact he's not poor. Now, is this figure in the ballpark, I have read it in the, in the media, that uh, if we could terminate double dipping, it would save about a billion dollars a year? They don't? That's, that's small in Social Security terms. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> that's five days but, outgo. But you see, that's, <laughs> that's very likely to, to be taken it's care of, again, so fairly, <laughs> fairly quickly. It's, it's likely to be taken care of. Uh, and, and the reason 
this is the reason I said we must stay away from, the, from trying to make Social Security into a welfare system. Social Security is entitled to people as a matter of right, but if we are giving them a, a, a specially large return on their investment on the theory that they're poor, then we're, again, loading down what, is, what should be an insurance system uh, with, uh, with uh, requirements that, that rather should be borne by all the taxpayers, not just those who work within a certain wage level. Let's we, give this... Yes, I'm sorry. We ought to come back to the point about uh, equalization of treatment of men and women. Mm -hmm. The um, ironic fact there is that most of the discrimination against women consists of not giving them the right for their male associates to get certain benefits that the female relatives of men get. Uh, for example, if a man dies, his widow automatically qualifies for a widow's benefit. If a woman dies, her, her, the widower would have to prove that he had gotten more than half his support from her in order to collect benefits. And so if you equalize it, either you eliminate benefits to widows, which isn't very likely to happen, or else you give widowers exactly the same benefits you gave widows, so that the right the woman doesn't have is not so much to get money for herself as it is to have her male relatives, uh, dependents, get the funds. Now, there are some other things that uh, work in a different way. There are a lot of situations where women have to pay Social Security taxes all their working lives and will never get a penny they wouldn't have gotten if they hadn't paid them. Yes, that's the problem, and that's the problem the women see and object to. They say that if they are working wives, they are subsidizing the system and getting nothing back in return since they work intermittently as wives, in many cases, having families and so forth. They never will draw enough to, uh, to reach the level of their derivative benefits they get through their husband. And therefore, everything they pay into Social Security adds nothing to their pension. And that's, uh, that's something that I think has to be corrected as a matter of fairness, well, the council, regardless of the, the cost. The council did recommend doing something about that, adding the two together. Another, another problem that the uh, working wife has is when she looks across the street, she sees the non-working housewife. Uh, who automatically obtains 50% of her husband's benefit by reason of having been married uh, to someone who was covered by the system, even though the woman across the street did not pay directly into the system. Before we go to the question and answer session, let's come at this from another angle. Uh, I found a, in the letters to the editor in the Times last week the following. Uh, it was from a man who describes himself as an owner of a small business, 17 employees, and an individual taxpayer. And he objected strongly to substantial increases in Social Security taxes because they directly confront, he says, two of the nation's most urgent priorities, reducing inflation and unemployment. He says that uh, in the face of substantial increases, he would have to lay off two or three of his workers. And he adds, the proposed increase is of such magnitude that it will decrease actual disposable income for Americans earning over $15,000, which today includes the majority of the workforce. Secondly, the only way companies can afford to pay the increased costs of Social Security is by increasing prices, thus creating new inflation. Uh, uh, this is a, an interrelationship of this yes. program with the others. Would I ask the members, well, the gentleman from Congress, if this is a deep concern, the yes, impact you'll have on inflation and it's unemployment. It's got to be a concern. Uh, if you tax something, you discourage it. You know the old uh, legalisms about the power to tax, the power to destroy, and so forth. If you tax something, you discourage it. You're taxing labor in this case. And therefore, it's a bad uh, thing to raise taxes when you have a high unemployment rate. As a matter of fact, it's a bad thing to raise taxes generally. Uh, but, uh, but it's a particularly onerous tax in an economic sense. You are raising the cost of labor without increasing its productivity, and anything that does that reduces the demand for labor. And, uh, and for that reason, we ought to try to find other ways of taxing if we can, and, uh, and try to keep the burden from getting too great on, on the payroll. I would say, uh, though there have been proposals that would put the whole burden on employers. Uh, and, uh, and we've resisted that very strongly. We, uh, I think the committee feels that the 50-50 traditional split between employer and employee uh, is, is fair and should be continued. Now, there's the problem of the self-employed, uh, and, and we've, 
I think, uh, arrived at generally a formula that uh, whereas you have, uh, if, if you figure 50% uh, uh, paid by the employee and 50 by the employer, you got 100%, well, we figure 75% is a good criteria for what the self-employed should pay. Now, this is a fairly uh, a heavy burden on self-employed. There's no question about that, but, and yet you, you've got to realize that that, that person gets uh, the full benefits uh, out of the fund with 75% contribution that the, uh, the um, other employer working for someone else uh, would get by paying 100%. So I think you have to balance out these, uh, these problems in, in the most equitable way. There is no tax that is not onerous. There is no tax that is not, in a sense, inflationary because uh, certainly uh, the uh, consumers... Uh, uh, ultimately pay all taxes, but uh, it's our job to, uh, uh, to try to find the most equitable. We have a problem between base and rate increases, and uh, it's a very difficult one. I think most members of Congress feel that it's easier to go the base route because it affects less people. Uh, our base uh, next year will be 17.7, uh, and uh, 86 or 87 percent of the workforce comes under that base, uh, so that if you increase the base, you only affect about 14% of the people of the country, uh, and, uh, and, and that, therefore, is, is the way that generally the Congress feels it should go. But we uh, must try to, uh, to maintain a proper mix between rate and base increases, uh, and I think, generally speaking, uh, we've done pretty well at it. There, there are some problems, though, with raising the, the base, even though it's, it's uh, more painless. Um, for instance, as you raise the base, you also raise the potential uh, pension. And you'll get a much bigger spread in pensions eventually, and uh, there'll be a strong temptation on the part of Congress to tax benefits, something we should not do because the em employees have paid in with after-tax money. And therefore, uh, as a matter of strict uh, tax principle, they should not be taxed on the Social Security benefits. And yet you get those pensions way up through raising the base, there's going to be a temptation to do that. Also, we've been financing cost of living increases by raising the wage base under existing law. And as you raise the wage base way up, you reduce your capacity to finance cost of living increases by further raises in the wage base because you have less and less people above that wage base. There are, there are all kinds of difficulties with that, of course. Also, it cuts into the private pension plan uh, system more to have a wage base increase than it does to have a rate increase. But the rate increase, of course, is objected to primarily because it affects everybody, including people at very low wages. Commissioner? Well, it's the latter point I was going to make, that if you uh, elect to use the tax rate uh, as a revenue development device in lieu of the wage base, you increase the tax burden on the lowest paid uh, worker and many people feel that his share of this tax is already disproportionate. I personally think that it is to begin with. So you add to that. Uh, yes. that but, but a rate base, sure. a rate increase, makes the system more sound actuarially, while a, a wage base increase uh, ultimately uh, involves a higher payout down the road and so doesn't help the actuarial uh, uh, position of the system at all. Well, as you go up the base scale, of course, the fewer and fewer <laughs> people are involved. And, and so, uh, you know, whereas we could achieve a lot with uh, a few hundred dollars base increase when you're down the lower levels, as you get up to $30,000, you have to raise it several thousand dollars uh, to get the same amount of revenue. So uh, the answer, the problem is going to be solved. We're going to run out of base one of these days, and we're going to have to uh, ha have to uh, Could go, I make go one, to rates. Can I make one last point about the wage base versus the, the rate? I happen to think that as you move into the wage base, you really uh, uh, add to the uh, tax burden on the middle wage earner. And in terms of public support, I think you tend to undermine over time his support. He is the... Uh, He's the wage earner who's felt, uh, rightly or wrongly, he's felt that he's had to carry the highest share. So you have to weigh that in that equation. Well, but he, but he does get a retirement program yes, and does. a disability yeah. program and increased benefits. He is, in, he is buying a retirement program and a pretty darn good one in the process of paying more uh, as the base goes up. Now, that's one of the things people criticize. One of these days, uh, the highest... Uh, 
salaried people are going to get uh, 1000 or $1,500 a month benefits out of the Social Security system, whereas somebody else might only get the minimum. Uh, the guy's paid in all his life, but, uh, but it, that kind of disparity in the system is going to create some problems. He doesn't get any more disability benefit or any more Medicare benefit than the fellow at the very low uh, wage. And uh, that's another reason why his confidence is undermined. If you raise the, the base up a great deal, it affects only his retirement no. pension. It doesn't affect that's any right. of the other elements of coverage, which now amount to over 30 percent of the total payout of the Social Security system. In view of the Pepper bill extending the age for compulsory retirement from 65 to 70, uh, what would happen in Social Security? The assumption would be that uh, there would be a change in retirement dates in that, and if it were changed under Social Security from 65 to 70, would it be beneficial to the problems that now faced, or would it be a further burden? As with most of the uh, choices that have to be made, there are two edges to the sword. It would reduce the total long-term cost of the program. People retire later. Uh, that reduces the size of the benefit rolls, the number of people on the rolls. But on the other hand, um, if you uh, raise the retirement age to, say, 68, which has been discussed recently, uh, at the same time leave the uh, optional retirement at age 62, a gap of eight years, in my judgment, you invite more people to retire early, and you tend to uh, create a new work disincentive. Uh, I think the question needs to be examined very carefully before we make that choice, but I do think it should be examined. All right, I think it's time to open the question and answer session. May I have the first question, please? My name is William Xiao, and I'm a professor at Harvard University. In the past, uh, the Congress has maintained the financial integrity of the Social Security program by providing adequate financing for a 75-year period. In correcting the double indexing problem, the Congress has adopted a benefit formula which is indexed by the increases in the average wages in the economy. And the cost of such benefit program at the turn of the century will require the payroll tax to rise as high as 18, 19 percent. Meanwhile, there is an alternative way to index in the benefit that is indexed by the consumer price index, which would give Congress the option to provide adequate financing for the whole 75-year period. I would like to understand uh, what, why Congress decided that's not a uh, desirable option to choose. At the, at the present time, uh, we are, uh, our system is providing roughly 45 uh, percent replacement rate. Uh, now, what is replacement well, rate, sir? Well, uh, 45% of the, uh, of the uh, uh, salary. Uh, Final uh, pay. Uh, you know, terminal pay. <laughs> um, and that, of course, is, uh, is uh, by many people, considered not adequate. The system you're describing, indexing to the CPI, would reduce the replacement rate still further. Uh, your system would go farther to, uh, uh, to correct the actuarial imbalance in the system, uh, and, uh, and I can't deny that. But it was a political decision not to go below 40 percent replacement rate. Uh, we uh, are likely to wind up with somewhere between 40 and 45 percent, which has been historically the level. Isn't that correct, Al? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to add a comment to that by way of an observation. Uh, in a way, this is a choice for the future between future benefit rights that would keep pace in the future with prices versus a future benefit right that would ensure today's workers that when they retire, they will enjoy upon retirement whatever improvement in the standard of living that might have occurred uh, between now and the time of that retirement. That's a, another way of describing the 40% uh, dropping below the 40% uh, area. The other observation is that the last two administrations examined this, these two choices very carefully, and both a Republican administration and a Democratic administration came to the same choice, and both the House and the Senate have examined those two choices very carefully, and they have come out th at the same point. It seems to me that this is one area where one of the difficult choices will have been made with a very strong consensus, a bipartisan consensus at that. The Advisory Council also recommended Correct. doing it the way that's now. 
Now, Mr. Shaw left out a very important fact in stating his question, which is the wages generally rise a couple percent more per year over the long run they have than prices do. Therefore, it does make quite a difference which you index by. All right, next question, please. My name is Steve Calkins, and I am a Washington attorney. This may not be fair, but if possible, I would like to ask whether, as a matter of principle, they are opposed to taxing Social Security benefits even if they are earned by people making a couple of tens of thousands of dollars. Mr. Chairman? Well, I think, that, you know, we've been talking to the Treasury about uh, this possibility in, in connection with tax reform, and I think what they came out with was uh, was some, and, and I don't think it's going to be recommended, but if it were recommended, uh, they would not start from the first dollar, but they would start uh, uh, incrementally uh, at 15000 and above or whatever. But uh, we, we, uh, we do the same thing, for instance, with veteran. We were talking about the same thing with be veteran benefits and unemployment compensation. Uh, and and um, it, it does seem to me that you, you, as w uh, that we should be moving in this direction. We should begin to tax all income. It's very difficult politically, but as a matter of principle, I think we should be moving in that direction. It, it'll be a while before we can get there, and certainly we, c we should start in the higher brackets uh, rather than in the lower brackets. I'm in favor of taxing all income in some way, but certainly not twice. And that's what you're doing if you're, uh, if you're contributing, uh, if you're taxing uh, pensions resulting from after-tax uh, contributions. But they do that all the time, Barbara. Well, all right, they do it all the time. I don't approve of it. So I guess I'd have to say as a matter of principle, I don't want to see us treating people differently in the, under the Social Security system because uh, they, uh, some of them don't happen to need money that is, be, that is being paid back to them as a result of their contributions. Uh, I, I, I think that we have too much of that sort of thing in well, our system. Are you suggesting that if I take $100 out of my after-tax income and put it in the savings bank that the interest I get should be tax-exempt? Uh, Alan, uh, uh, that is... <laughs> Uh, look, my friend, if you want to, if you want to advocate well, that, I'll deal with that I when you do you, it. We're you talking were about advocate. Social Security here tonight, and I'll tell you that we have a contract with the American people on Social Security, which I think we should change uh, um, with, uh, with considerable reluctance. And uh, one important aspect of that is that we have said it is not to be need-related. Now, if you start taxing it, it's going to be a big step toward need relation instead of contribution relation. Next question, please. Uh, yes, sir. My name is uh, Richard Burkhauser. I'm a member of the Institute for Research on Poverty, University of Wisconsin. I'd like to ask uh, either representative how um, the House can, on one hand, almost unanimously approve uh, an end of mandatory uh, retirement rules, presumably to encourage older people to work Yet on the other hand, do nothing about what amounts to effectively a 70% tax rate on these people if they continue to work because of loss of Social Security benefits plus payment of federal income taxes as opposed to getting uh, Social Security uh, benefits tax-free. Well, Let me say that, uh, that, I, that I think the Congress is moving toward an increase of the, ben uh, of the benefit incentives for continuing on in, in the workforce. Uh, it's now 1% uh, annually, and, and, uh, and the Congress, I think, certainly is, is, is talking about moving at least to 3%, uh, uh, and that would be a, some compensation, certainly, for what you're talking about, and we're attempting to, to move in that direction. All right, next question, please. I'm Bert Seidman. I'm the director of the Social Security Department of the AFL-CIO. The Social Security program, I'm sure we'd all agree, is a social insurance system. And while the benefits are related to wages, they are not exactly related to wages. And as a number of members of the panel have said this evening, those in the lower wage brackets receive proportionately higher benefits. In addition to that, in the early years of the program, there were people who received benefits far out of proportion to any taxes that had been imposed on them. My question is, since the social insurance program is 
a social insurance program and therefore different from a private insurance program, should the entire uh, revenue source for the program come from payroll taxes or aren't there costs which are costs which ought to be borne by the whole country and therefore come from other sources? Let me, uh, let me relate to, to that. Um, you certainly, I, I think we've about come to the end of the road on payroll taxes. I, I, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, we may have exceeded the, uh, the proper level of payroll taxes. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should dip into general revenues. I'm strongly opposed to that. I think the social part of the program, I, I don't deny that because it's a mandatory program, it does affect a lot of people who otherwise would save nothing. Uh, and uh, and uh, that there is some social advantage in that because it keeps them off the welfare rolls. But where we've got in trouble with Social Security uh, is, has been that we have assumed the people at the bottom of the scale are poor without knowing whether they are or not and have um, tended for that reason constantly to pump up the system to put an additional six billion dollars in in benefit increases in order to get a billion of it to the people at the bottom of the scale who are assumed to be poor. Welfare should be paid for by everybody through the general treasury and through the uh, and through the graduated income tax, in my view. But I, don't, I, I would like to restrain the enthusiasm for turning welfare or, or Social Security into a welfare system. I think once we do that, we've got a time bomb uh, for all those, those investing workers who thought they were contributing to their retirement rather than just paying another tax. All right, one final question. Sir. Uh, I'm Jim Buchanan, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, I realize this is going out to a general audience, and I realize the political popularity of uh, playing on illusions about the employer portion of the tax, but surely I think a group of economists here should not let Congressman Ullman get away with the comment he made in the general point that the employer portion of the tax is somehow not played by the employee. My question is specifically, surely, Congressman Ullman, you don't believe that nonsense. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> this public policy forum on the problems and the future of Social Security has brought you the viewpoints of four experts. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.